Now we're going to review a few extra OpenCL things. Well, they're not really extra, but they didn't fit into a great category. So we're going to talk about how you query devices, that is how you find out things about the devices in your system, how you handle images, and OpenCL events. And we'll see events are really important when you combine this with this asynchronous command execution, and particularly when you have multiple devices. So the first part here is querying devices. There's an OpenCL command, CL get device info, that can give you lots of seemingly useful information about devices. So for example, you can call it with CL device max compute units. And this will tell you the number of compute units that can run in parallel on a device. So obviously the more compute units you have, the faster the device is going to be. You can call CL device max clock frequency. It'll tell you the maximum frequency a device will run at. Well, this begs the question, when would the device ever not be at the maximum frequency? You can call CL device global memory size. It'll tell you the global memory that's available on the device. So how much memory space do you have on the device? You can call something you wouldn't expect here, CL device image support. Does this open CL device support images? And you'd think every GPU would support images, but it turns out some older AMD GPUs didn't have quite the right support, so they didn't support images. FPGAs, for example, will also not support images, and some early uh, CPU implementations did not support images. You can also look up device extensions. So there are all sorts of things, double precision, atomic operations, vendor-specific ones. So for example, AMD has a C++ extension to OpenCL, and you can find out about that by looking at device extensions. Now, there's a caveat here. These things don't tell you what you want to know. So the number of max compute units, if you compare two GPUs, it doesn't necessarily mean one will be faster than the other. It could be very different sorts of GPUs. The max clock frequency, well, a device may, may not run at all at the max clock frequency if, for example, your laptop's running on battery power. It may be your laptop will only run at max frequency for the GPU when it's plugged into the wall. Or it may be that it's too hot to run at max frequency. The global memory size here is the total memory available to the GPU. If other things are using it, say the screen, and if you look at what's on your screen here, this whole image is being stored on the GPU, well, that takes up some of this memory. So just because this tells you you have a gigabyte of memory doesn't mean you can actually use the full gigabyte of memory. So these are useful for getting a rough idea, but don't rely on them for specific exact values. All right, images. OpenCL supports 2D and 3D image types natively. It makes sense. It's designed to work with GPUs, which do a lot with images. So you have multi-channel images, you have intensity images, all sorts of things, and lots of formats. 8, 16, 32, signed, unsigned, and float. So you think about how that might apply in this class. Native image types give you some nice capabilities. You can get linear interpolation between points, you can get wrapping around the edges, so you can look at the edges of things without getting crashes, and you can have clamping at the edges if you want to stop at the edges. So some nice features here for dealing with images. Why do they have this? Well, it's pretty simple. These are hardware accelerated. Remember, we're running on a GPU. G stands for graphics. These things are designed to do graphics. They have lots of hardware for handling images. And OpenCL wants to enable that for people who happen to be doing graphics through OpenCL or anything like it. Another really nice thing here is that GPUs have always cache texture lookups. So modern GPUs have small caches on them, but they do a much better job of caching textures. So you can get a lot of benefits out of that. There's a downside to this. If you use these native image types on a CPU, it's really slow. And it's slow because there is no hardware for this, and this linear interpolation has to be done all in software, and so that will slow you down. Also, not all formats are supported. So you have to go through and check that the type you want, the format you're looking for, is supported before you use it, or you'll get an error when you try to use that format. If you're using images, writing to them is not as fast as reading them. It's just not optimized for that. And on some devices, it can be very, very slow. So if you're writing back your result, you want to test to make sure that writing it to an image is actually reasonably fast. And if not, you want to go ahead and write it to a regular buffer. So the last thing I want to talk about here are events. And I made a point earlier which may not have been completely obvious. So queues for different devices are asynchronous. Well, we know all queues are asynchronous, but they're asynchronous with respect to each other. So this is interesting. It means that if you have multiple devices, you have to synchronize between them. Because one device may go forward in its queue faster than the other or slower, and if you care about the synchronization between them, you have to take care of that. 
So this also applies to out of order queues. So usually when you create an OpenCL queue, it's in order. First thing you put in runs first, the second thing second. You can create out of order queues, which allows the hardware to reorder things if it can run them faster. And if you have to enforce different orders with an out of order queue, you need to be explicit about that too. The way you're explicit about that is with events. So let's take a look at how events work in OpenCL. So every CL in queue command has three things at the end. Three things here are number of events in list, wait list, and events returned. And what these are is it can return an event to track it. So the last thing here will give you an event object which tracks this thing you enqueued. So if I enqueue a kernel here and I ask for an event back, I can use this event to find out if the kernel's done, and I can use this event to have other things wait for the kernel to finish. So this part's the event you return, but you also get a list of events to wait for. So that's this other part here. Here I've told it, here's the number of events I want you to wait for in my list, and here's a list of events that you should wait for. So by combining the two of these, I can tell things that I enqueue to wait for particular things to finish before they go ahead and execute. You can also do some other fun things with events. You can get profiling information. So I can ask this event, what is the time that it was enqueued, when it was submitted, when it started and ended. So I can see how long it waited in the queue, and I can see how long it took to execute once it got to the device. So let's take a look at an example of events here. So say I have a kernel A that's generating some output, and I want that output to be used by kernel B as its input. But kernel A runs on the CPU, and kernel B runs on the GPU. So I've got a problem here. I need to make sure that kernel B waits for kernel A to finish because B needs the output from A. If B runs before A is finished, it'll have garbage data as its input because A's output won't be ready and you'll get corrupt values. So how do we do this? Well, it's pretty simple. We're going to use events. We're going to go in here and we're going to take kernel A. When we enqueue it, we're going to get an event back. And then when we enqueue kernel B, we're going to tell it, I want you to wait on this one event. This will cause kernel B to wait and not execute until kernel A finishes. So pretty straightforward. Now let's take a look at this in a little more detail. So what's missing here? Well, what's missing here is that we need to go and we need to write the data from the CPU and we copy it to the other device. So remember, kernel A here is running on the CPU, kernel B is running on the GPU. So when kernel A finishes, we need to copy its data from the CPU to the GPU. So what we really need here is we need to enqueue the kernel here. We need to have that kernel return an event, do a copy, have the copy wait for that event, enqueue this kernel here, but have this kernel wait on the copy. So we need to explicitly move the data back and forth and make sure that we do that in a synchronized manner.